Karibuni. I am Warden Wilson Mutua, and I am happy to welcome you to Harambe Wildlife Reserve. <laughs> Epcot Center celebrates human achievements and innovation born from imagination. My name is Tom Arno 2.0, and I'll be your travel guide. Just make believe you're a tiny little seed. Tiny little seed that's reaching up to meet your needs. In order to demonstrate the animation process, we're going to turn you into an animated character. Does this mean I'm only going to have three fingers? W, w Radio, your information station. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 192 for the week of October 17th, 2010. There are many layers to the Walt Disney World experience, and part of what I try and do on the show, site, and in my books and CDs is help you peel back many of them to help you enjoy the parks and resorts in new and exciting ways. From highlighting the stories to the details, history, trivia, and overlooked experiences, visiting the parks is so much more than simply enjoying the attractions on their face. But one way to enjoy and explore the parks is to take advantage of the many opportunities that are available. And this week, we'll explore just one of those ways as we look at the top 10 educational opportunities in Walt Disney World. And not just for kids, there are countless ways to not just learn but enhance your experience, as well as educate others about so many different things in so many different ways. This will be a fun look at the parks from a unique perspective that will hopefully help you look at your next visits as the ones that are filled with wonderful... This will be a fun look at the parks from a unique perspective that will help you look at your next visits as ones that are filled with wonderful opportunities. I'll have some announcements and then play more of your voicemails at the end of the show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. Epcot Center celebrates human achievements an innovation born from imagination. It is a showplace dedicated to entertain, we hope, with a purpose. Our goals for Epcot Center are quite clear. We want to first entertain, then inform and inspire all who come here, and above all, to instill in our guests a new sense of belief and pride in mankind's ability to shape a world that offers real hope to people everywhere in the world. I've said for as long as I can remember that Walt Disney World is so much more than attractions and shows and resorts and, of course, great dining experience. And in fact, as time has gone on, and it really started when writing my first Walt Disney World trivia book, even more so now with the show and the recent audio guides. I keep saying that Walt Disney World is actually a land of opportunities. And by that, I mean there are many opportunities. There's the opportunity to create memories with family and friends, to make new friends, uh, as many of us have, to experience other cultures, to indulge yourself or be a kid again. The list goes on and on. Uh, It's really endless. But there's another layer that I think many people overlook. And that's because there are many educational opportunities as well. And by that, I don't mean just for kids. And don't start to snore when I say educational. Because Walt Disney said, quote, I'd rather entertain and hope that people learn something than educate people and hope they were entertained. And I think that that tenant holds true in the Disney parks and even Epcot Center when it opened with a much more serious and educational theme to it, has always been about fun first, with maybe some incidental learning snuck in there as well. So to maybe help you explore some of these opportunities, which you may have overlooked, I wanted to bring you 
the top 10 educational opportunities in Walt Disney World. And when you think about top 10s, you think about a man who's always starved for entertainment, education, and a good funnel cake. He is, of course, Tim Bananas Foster from Guide to the Magic and Celebrations Magazine. I, I'm, I'm glad you seem to have forgotten about the pickles. I, you know, I'm, that's actually coming later on. Uh, <laughs> that's great. So when I suggested this idea to you, you were very excited. And I think when we talk about education in Walt Disney World, Tim, and tell me if this has been sort of your experience as well, I think a lot of people's minds go right to Epcot. They think, well, this is the educational park. This is where all the learning takes place. Magic Kingdom's about fun. Uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios is about sort of this this fantasy of Hollywood. Disney's Animal Kingdom is really about sort of exploration and animals and safaris and things like that. But Ep- Epcot really has had a, the reputation of being the educational park. It was funny. I, when we first came up with this, I didn't see how we were going to get out of Epcot. <laughs> and I, I thought we'd have to put a self-imposed rule on there. Only two attractions from Epcot apiece, except for the 48 you were going to put on your honorable mention list but as i started going through this i I was coming up with a lot more uh that was outside of epcot which um which i found surprising well part of what made me well part of what made me think about this was something outside of epcot completely and i said and it was an educational opportunity for me that i didn't realize was going to happen as i was researching something and it made me very excited about a topic that I honestly hadn't had a lot of interest in before that. And look, we kid around, kind of true, that the top 10s are really (laughs) top 300s. And for this one, I said, well, here's the, you know, I had sort of four or five in my mind, but as I started to write down the list, I really could have gone to town. And And I started to think, Tim, that we almost really could have done one for each park, and and maybe we should, and not just the at- entire resort, because there are so many different ways to learn and different things that you can learn about. In st- forget the resort, just inside the parks. Yeah, in fact, I'm looking at the list I whittled it down to, and I ended up staying in Epcot most of the time anyway. <laughs> but yeah, we could. Um, uh, it would be neat if we went around each park, and we could do our top five in each park. But we don't have time for that nonsense. Time. Time is on our side. You know, now is the time. It is the best time. But uh, just, just so I just so I feel good. Uh, let me make sure I'm in the spirit of this endeavor here is, is can I count um, going to Splash Mountain and being educated to the fact that even if I cower and hide behind a six foot seven gentleman who's very nice, but very big, that still won't protect me from the water cannon. Is that a form of education? Because I learned I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> you know, I said that there were many layers to the onion, and that is sort of the outside <laughs> skin onion? Of, of the onion that I was not referring to, uh, because <laughs> I think there are real educational opportunities here. There are things for both kids and adults to learn. And look, if you are taking your, if you ever struggle with the idea of taking your children out of school to go and visit Walt Disney World, here's how you can help justify it. Because there are ways and opportunities for you and your kids to learn together or for you to go to a specific place. And that's sort of what I was thinking, especially with my first one, to help your child learn. And it runs the gamut from social studies to American folklore to, uh, you know, mathematics and physics and architecture, engineering you know, the list literally goes on and on, as will this segment most probably. So, again, I'm going to preface the segment with my requisite apology. We really should stop calling these top tens. They're really almost maybe the best of the best, you know, the best of the best educational opportunities. This way we can go to 300 and it's not a big deal. I think with this show, if I pull out my archives, of which I have ex- an extensive library of, <laughs> I can make the top 10 moments where Lou said this is more than a top 10. I think you finally hit it. <laughs> So we'll we'll consider. I mean, although nothing has the ring that top ten with Tim does, that's but, right. Um, best of the best of the best with Bananas Foster. Maybe Ooh. that's how it. You know, uh, it yeah. sort of rolls. I have to yeah. get that domain name as well. So first uh, person who comes up to me on the street and says that we'll get a free get a free celebration. From me. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 
So do you want to go first or do you want me to go first to sort of set the tone? Of- I'm going to let you go first because you – now we'll lay out all your ground rules, which you didn't share with me, which will nullify half of my list. That'll give me time to Yeah, this will give you time to come up with something. And I will not lay any ground rules. I'm going to tell you what – and again, these are sort of no in no real uh, order of importance to me or, or the level of opportunity. But this is what, for me, was my one little spark to sort of come up with this idea. And I think one of the greatest educational opportunities – in Walt Disney World, and this is not a shameless plug for the audio guide, but then again, maybe it is, is in Liberty Square. Uh, I think Liberty Square was such a learning experience for me because there is such real historical importance there uh, beyond the entertainment like the Haunted Mansion. But you can learn about the history of the United States and the people that really were the founding fathers and mothers of this nation in a true three-dimensional classroom. And I think we as parents or caregivers or uncles or grandparents have a great opportunity to educate those, the next generation of guests uh, about the land's connection to American history, whether it be inside an attraction or wandering the town of Liberty Square. I, Tim, really got an appreciation for U.S. history, which is something, and this, especially this colonial time, which is something that was not of great interest to me. I learned a lot about the people that shaped our, our, our nation. And I also learned about, beyond the real American history, I also learned, if you're a Disney fan, about the history and its connection to Walt Disney and the Imagineers that brought it to life, and what a patriot Walt was, and how this was such a very personal project for him, not Liberty Square per se, but his desire to bring this sense of patriotism to his park, something he had hoped to do with Disneyland. So I learned about our American presidents. I learned about geography, literature, the founding fathers, the the architecture of the town, the music, uh, the, the, the simple magic that goes into the Imagineering to create some of the effects, uh, American folklore and, and literature, so, so much more. I think Liberty Square is, for being so small, uh, is, is just filled with so many incredible opportunities to learn and to educate. That's the should- spirit of the, of the segment. I love. We should do a show on Liberty Square. <laughs> as long as you don't go to Liberty Square with the intention of learning how to spell Pennsylvania by reading the Liberty Bell, <laughs> you're going to get it wrong. But you might learn something by learning out why it's spelled wrong. And right. I won't give away the answer because, frankly, I forget what the answer was. But that's the beauty is that you can it learn is. not just about what's going on inside the four corners of the park, but – why is – you're right. You know, what is the connection of the Liberty Bell and the Liberty Tree to America, to Pennsylvania? Why is Pennsylvania spelled wrong? You know, learn about the original 13 colonies. Learn about why the rooms inside the Liberty Tree Tavern are the way they are and the stories that that shape the foundation of this land. And, I mean, you said this before. I've said this before. Liberty Square um, probably – contains some of the most overlooked things in, in the Magic Kingdom because to be honest, most people go Haunted Mansion, get in, get out, and leave and, and overlook all the other treasures that are hidden there. And even walking around with you one day when we were doing our Liberty Square, I was seeing things I hadn't seen before because you wouldn't let me go get an egg roll in Adventureland because I was hungry. <laughs> Pickles at the pickle barrel. Come on. But, but it is, it's, a, it's a great place to explore and one that most, that most people don't even think to explore, partly because it is so small. Um, you feel like you're in, you walk in and you walk out and you're done. But, but um, take the time and look at it. There's a lot to learn, a lot, to, lot, to, lot of treasures to find. You're right. I think a lot of people look at Liberty Square as a thoroughfare between the hub and Frontierland or Fantasyland and Frontierland or a way to get to the Haunted Mansion and move on. And I think that you can and you should literally spend hours in that land. I mean, if, if you really want to appreciate the level of detail and story in the park, uh, Liberty Square is a great way to do it in a very small environment. I'm going to map out the uh, Lumangello ideal Walt Disney World vacation. 
So right now I got day one, day two, Animal Kingdom. So day three I'm going to have from 10 a.m. to, what do you say, two or three? Sure. At Liberty Square. So good thing I got that 21-day park ticket. Yeah, and, and make sure you allot enough time for dining <laughs> in there, too. Oh, There's well, at least goes, five meals a day. So. That goes without saying. Um, all right, so for my first one, I was trying to imagine, and I think I got a pretty good idea of what this would be like, the typical Lou Mangello morning. <laughs> Yikes. Um, I'm, imagining, I'm imagining Tai Chi in the backyard. <laughs> The requisite 50 one-handed push-ups. You stop me when I'm wrong. Um, the practicing the karaoke in front of the mirror. And, of course, your daily recital of the ABCs. And, of course, Lou, you know who invented the ABCs. If you say thank the Phoenicians, I'm yes. telling you. <laughs> Thank the Phoenicians for inventing the ABC. Um, but they didn't invent the ABCs. That, ah, forget it. <laughs> oh, what, you were there? I'm practically old enough to be, but well, it, <laughs> quick sidetrack. They didn't, technically the Phoenicians did not invent the ABCDE alphabet, but that's okay. We understand what, what Dame understand Judy was trying to get. understand the gist of right. what she was saying. In any event, obviously, I'm in Spaceship Earth right now. Um, Walter Cronkite, Jeremy Irons, I miss you guys. I love Jeremy you guys. I, Jeremy Irons is my favorite. Um, East, and I think it mostly North, has South. to do with the fact that I lost a bet to my wife on that fact because I didn't think it was Jeremy Irons, and she did. And I guess I'm supposed to do the dishes for the next 10 years. I haven't started yet. Um, now, Spaceship Earth... Um, Obviously, obviously, very educational if, if you approach it that way. I think that the cool thing about it, though, is um, right as you said, Walter Cronkite, Jeremy Irons, I, I think everybody has their own impression of Spaceship Earth, depending on probably when you first started riding it. And we might josh a little bit about the narration today and the ABCs and how some of it may be maybe overly simplified if you look at it from a certain point of view. Although from another point of view, I do think it is, it is a lot easier to understand, especially if you are young in years and, and if some of the older narration went over your head. Um, it's, it's just, um, I think it's, it's a, for me, it's the perfect marriage of, of a magical, dark, entertaining ride, which is one of my favorites. Um, Coupled with, yeah, you're going to learn some things along the way that you might not have known before. And I think, again, the more you, the more you ride and the more you pay attention, the more things you'll pick up on each time you go. And it's not, just, it's not just the picking up the little details as you go on, like finding different hidden Mickeys and different um, trinkets and details that you missed before, but, but hearing some things you might not have appreciated the first time around, or if you haven't been on it since the narration change and hearing some things from a different point of view. Um, and my favorite thing is when I punch in Japanese as my language, because I like to come out of it thinking I learned at least a little bit of Japanese, although I still fail to understand why I fell on the ski slope and broke my arm in the video at the end. I wasn't sure what <laughs> buttons I was pushing. Evidently, I like my medical care on the go, but... We need, to, uh, we need but, to ride this attraction together and get a screenshot of you and I in the, in the final uh, descent. Uh, I, uh, why? Oh, what, on the video, you mean? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, it's a good thing they changed because, as everyone probably knows by now, I cried like a baby at the last ending, which I still sorely miss. But I will say, having done a few kids' tours in Epcot and having been with a bunch of kids on the ride, it's, it amazes me how kids do enjoy that ride as slow as it is. And, and as you might think, it, it might be is it too educational, is it too boring? But I think between all the scenes and, and all the things there are to see, um, I haven't met a kid that hasn't loved it yet, unless they were scared of the dark. But. And Lou, I promise to hold your hand next time. I, uh, I'm going to let that go. I, I, I look at Spaceship Earth as well as one of those multi-layer educational opportunities. And, and here's what I mean. is I think that you can ride that attraction multiple times and focus on something different. So you can focus on the narration and learn the history of 
recorded communication and the genesis of what you know, I hate when she says about oh this think of it as the world's <laughs> first backup system but anyway <laughs> but you sort of get the ties from the early hand drawn cave paintings to what we have as far as modern technology and, and how we got to that point I think you can also ride through and almost ignore the narration and just watch the different scenes and watch the progression of technology and history and everything from the architecture to the language, to the science, to the dress, whatever it might be. You sort of got that, that three dimensional visual presentation of man throughout history. I think you also have the level of the curious child, the curious adult, how do they do that? How does Imagineering do it? How do they make those cave paintings move? How do the audio animatronics, how are they programmed? How do they make that oh-so-awesome smell of burning Rome? How do they do things with the music? So, so you can enjoy and appreciate the attraction and learn from it, I think, in a lot of different ways. That's beautiful. I worked on this all night. Good. <laughs> it shows. So... Uh, moving on to the next on my list, this one went through many iterations as, as I was making my notes because I went from the very general to the very specific and then sort of brought it back out again. And it, it's almost I almost didn't want to put it on this way because it was just too obvious. But certainly I think that World Showcase um, as a whole presents a, a, such a huge educational opportunity, again, both for children of many ages and for adults as well. Uh, I think here more so than anywhere else in Walt Disney world, it is vital uh, to interact with the cast members because they bring something very unique to their role because they are from the nations that are represented there. And it gives you a chance to talk to them. And, and I tell the story all the time because one of my best meals ever in world showcase was over in the San Angel Inn in Mexico. And it's not because the food itself was so good. It's because our server was so excited and so passionate and so happy to tell her story and tell talk about the food and talk about her town and how different or how similar the food and, and the Mexico Pavilion was in relation to that. We recorded it. We did a live review of it. And it really made for a great experience. Of course, you got to tie it into food. I think one of the best ways to learn about a culture is through their food. I don't think anything uh, is too crazy for the palate. So if, you, if you've ever been scared to go and try restaurant Marrakesh, you shouldn't because it's a great educational opportunity. There certainly there are exhibits, there are shows, there's attractions, whether it's O Canada, whether it's Norway, please stay for the film uh, or Impressions de France. Whatever it might be, um, even a boat ride like the Grand Fiesta Tour. Even the Food and Wine Festival, Tim, offers another level of educational opportunities. There's culinary demonstrations. There's wine presentations. There's wine schools. Learn how to pair food and wine, beverage seminars, guest speakers, book authors, so, so much more. I mean, World Showcase, for those people that just sort of blow through past the promenade and look on your maps and say, well, Morocco doesn't have a ride. Let's move on. You are missing such a huge, wonderful opportunity to learn again about the culture, the people, the food, the Imagineering and the architecture that went into it and really just how wonderful World Showcase really is. And did I mention the food? No, you didn't mention the food. That's amazing. <laughs> this is funny because uh, we could have done the top 10 just of the pavilions and We've had to have ditched one. I'm not sure which one it would have been. but And you're lucky I didn't have one of the countries as one of mine. Cause you can, but you can, though, because I think each presents its own unique opportunity. Well, I did, uh, but I didn't. So, But there you are, changing the rules again without letting me know. You've got to keep you on your toes, Foster. <laughs> the, thing, the thing about World Showcase, as you were saying that, um, as, I, as I was thinking about it, was to, like I said, many people go through World Showcase rather quickly for whatever reason, if they're trying to get to dinner or just getting to the other side of the park or heading to Maelstrom, and that's the end of the story. But um, so many of the pavilions have much more to offer 
even if you're taking your time and walking slowly along the promenade past all the countries, making sure you go in and explore. There's so many hidden treasures to find. It's surprisingly overlooked. I think some of it might be because people don't realize they're there. They're not marked very well and you might miss them but places like the church in Norway or the museum in the back of the Japan pavilion or the art gallery in the Morocco pavilion um, these are all places that are, are well worth going to and exploring and the best part is you'll probably be in there by yourself because mo pe most people miss them but pretty much each and every pavilion has something like that so it's, it, like I said it's definitely worth exploring and learning more about the, the host country where you're at Definitely. Oh, it's my turn. Where shall we go? <laughs> I went on for I'm a long time to I'm give you time to come up with something. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to get out of Epcot. All right, this one's... Hmm. All right, we'll do this one first. I'm going to go over to the studios. Mm. Mm. I like it. And I'm sure this has to be on your list somewhere. The One Man's Dream exhibit. I don't hear any moaning. I guess I didn't have it, it on. It's on my list as part of something else. Uh, well, not anymore because I just stole it from you. So. Um, now, the one man's name, which I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Lou, is currently closed. Is that correct? It not is. Too much it's, uh, it's being refurbed, and I'm, I'm excited, believe it or not, for what D23 is going to bring in for the reimagineered one man's dream. Lots of new so artifacts coming. So some of what I say might not exist when it reopens again. So I'll try and just give a brief overview. I'm not sure. You might know, Lou, how much it's changing. I'm not actually sure myself. But in any event, um, to me, um, even beyond Tower of Terror and the Rock and Roller Coaster, which everyone who listens to the show knows I cannot wait to get on those attractions whenever I go to the studios, but... Um, one Man's Dream is, oddly enough, one of the highlights of the studios every time I go to visit it, um, I, I, for a number of reasons. I think for someone who just is a junkie for learning about Walt Disney and Disney World and how this all came to be, uh, there's nothing like walking through the exhibit and uh, looking at the models and looking at the old drawings and the old plans and seeing Walt Disney giving the original Epcot speech right in front of your eyes. Um, but I, th I think another part of this for me is having that moment when you're at Walt Disney World, no matter where you are. And to me, it can happen anywhere. It can happen when you see an old cartoon on TV in the lobby of a, of a resort or if you see a character. Just when you get that, when you remember, you get that realization that this place is not just a theme park. It's not just an amusement park. It's not even just a really amazing amusement park. This is the um, evolution of, of Walt Disney's imagination and dreams and just a sense of history that you get when you think about the characters and the films and everything everything that came before even the parks were imagined. And going through One Man's Dream, you get to see all this. You get to see Walt Disney's early, early days, his first forays into um, animation and early drawings and so forth. And to me, it's just it's really humbling to realize where, where you get a real sense of where you are and what this is all about. Um, and the thing for me, not, again, I don't know if it's still going to be there when it reopens, but the film at the end, um, I can't really explain why, but it was one of those tear-jerky moments for me. When I would see that film, it would, it would be something about it. I would confess I shed a little tear. But I, I think it was just realizing the enormity of what, what surrounds you and the history behind everything that you see. And, and it's not just a cool park. There's... There's characters, there's movies, there's film, there's imagination, there's a great man behind all of this. And to me, to me that's what I get out of One Man's Dream when I go. And, and I think, you know, for other people going, even for little kids, it's, it's just fascinating to see all the, uh, all the memorabilia and mementos that were there the, from Walt Disney's desk from his, and his second grade desk to early animatronics. It's just, darn it, it's just so cool to see all these things. <laughs> and while I agree with you, I think for me, the most important part about this attraction, and it is an, an attraction, is 
the fact that it's called Walt Disney One Man Stream because it's less for me about the memorabilia and the artifacts and the models and the props as it is about personalizing it all to Walt Disney and letting you understand, especially younger people who may not realize that he was a real person and this was his journey and these were his struggles and obstacles that he was able to overcome in the face of countless people who told him that it couldn't be done. And I think the story of the guy with $40 in his pocket following his dream and making all of this that we how now have and appreciate is incredibly educational, certainly. Uh, it's inspiring and it's informative and I think it presents a great way. And I think for a lot of people, the first and only way they really get to understand more about Walt Disney, the man. And that's why I think that is such a very, very important attraction and why I am so excited about it reopening. Agreed. That's it? You just give me agreed? That's it. You said it so well. <laughs> Again, I practice that all day. All right. Uh, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to move on to, again, something that's potentially obvious, So, but it's also it's a broad topic because I think that while there is so much to get from what's on the surface and the, the mul- these multiple layers that I keep talking about inside the parks, uh, Disney also makes it easy for you to learn more, especially if there is a topic that interests you. And they do that by more than 20 different backstage tours. And for geeks like me, when I learned at a young age, Tim, that I was able to have that curtain pulled back and have it shown to me how they make this 24-7, 365 real working city work and how they sort of create that magic that happens every day, didn't spoil it for me. I was incredibly fascinated by it. And I tried to take as many tours as often as I could to learn about everything from the DAX computer control system to going to see the Utilidors to wanting to see central shops and so much more. But they really do have something for everybody. So if Disney's Animal Kingdom is your thing, there's a backstage safari, there's Wild by Design that talks about the architecture. If the land pavilion and some of the things that you see there that the 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 dome and uh, the hydroponics you can take a behind the seeds tour if water is your thing and the seas there's you can swim with the dolphins and dol- dolphins in depth there's dive quest where you can actually get into the tank and get inside the attraction there's the aqua tour gardens of the world if the horticulture and the landscaping which is fascinating to me is interest of you Hidden Treasures of World Showcase. There's Segway Tours, Future World Tours. There's tours for the whole family if you want to go for family magic. There's more intense and longer tours like Keys to the Kingdom. There's Backstage Magic, which is like an eight-hour full-day tour. Uh, If trains are your thing, there's Magic Behind the Steam Trains. There's the Holiday Tours. And and to what your uh, last one was, There's the new Inspiration Through Walt's Eyes tours, which brings it again home to Walt Disney and lets you understand better the connection from what you see now to Walt Disney, who never got to see this dream realized. So I think those range in price and in duration and in uh, depth and level of both entertainment and education. And again, I think there's something there for everybody. And if you've never taken a backstage tour, I highly, highly recommend them. Well, speaking of tours, that'll actually take me to my next one. And this is actually, this is sort of related to the one I had before. I'm, I'm still in the studios. And for every young aspiring artist out there, um, even – even people who are fully versed in Photoshop, Lou, I know you don't really need to <laughs> have this, but in case you were interested, you know, every young artist, every young animator wannabe, uh, the Magic of Disney Animation Tour was also one of my must-go visits when I was at the studios. Um, very different, obviously, than when it started. Um, for those who didn't have the opportunity to take it earlier, you actually got to tour 
the real working studio and see animators at work. Um, now, of course, the animators aren't there, so you just see their offices. But but even today, I think, you know, I, I miss seeing the people there, obviously, but I, I think they still do a pretty good job of of uh, painting a picture, so to speak, of what it is like to be um, an animator. And I think for someone who loves to draw and, and loves the animated films and uh, loves to see how they were made, um, it's a really great experience to walk through and, and see the studios, again, whether there are people working in there or not, but just to see uh, the workstations that people would work at, the tools that they used, um, the different rooms they did, whether it was the sound rooms or the color rooms. Um, it's it's really neat to look at. And, and at the beginning of the tour, you have the film now with Mushu. Um, I, probably, I, I can guess that you probably prefer the Robin Williams, William Cronkite version of how to make a cartoon. Um, I actually prefer the Walter Cronkite version, but William Cronkite, I'm sure. I did, say? <laughs> did I say William Cronkite? <laughs> What is, his cousin you know William was I mean. a great stand in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking of Peter Pan there for you, but. Yeah, and I, I certain, I mean, I certainly Robin you Williams brought, a, brought a, that another one, level anyway, of, but, you know, fun to the film, so. Uh, but even now, walking through um, is pretty cool. And at the end now, they do have a lot of interactive things, um, more geared towards younger children, but they are, they are still need to. Um, to play with, whether you want to learn how to draw a Mickey Mouse for yourself or take a shot at doing some coloring yourself or doing voiceovers or finding out which character you really are. And if anybody's interested, I'm Tarzan, I think, is what it said. <laughs> yep, that's me. I am most that's, like yeah. Tarzan. When I see you, I, it's the first thing I think of. You is think Tarzan. Tarzan. There's a poll. There's a poll for the site. What Disney character does Tim Foster most emulate? Or resemble. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Come comment on the show notes this week. Okay. But, I, but again, even for me, I, in fact, I, some of my daughter's friends, and, and my daughter too, actually, is, are they're into animation and that sort of thing. One is actually going to school for animation. And um, I know for them and for me, um, just seeing the studios, it, that's like your dream job when you, you grow up watching the cartoons and watching the films and wanting to be a part of them. And even if you can't do it for a living, just seeing how they're made is, is, is quite an experience if you're into that sort of thing. I think, um, and I agree with you, this was part of, again, like One Man's Dream was part of another one that I had on my list um, because I think it's important for us. Look, we all love Disney movies in some form or fashion, I think it's important that we understand how the background work that goes into the finished product. And again, the interactive portion of that tour is what I enjoy the most. Yes, as the character meet and greets at the end, uh, they do sort of change the exhibit up near the end for uh, a film that's coming up. So I know Up was there for a while. Tangled is there right now. You can see some of the maquettes and some of the original drawings. And again, you sort of get that whole genesis of how it goes from concept to finished product. I too, Tim, loved the studios when it was a studio, and I loved being able to see on this tour, uh, as well as when they had the, the two-hour backstage tour, really getting to see people at work, and that went from the animators to the costumers to everybody else that was doing work on not just animated films, but TV shows as well, and I think that's one of the things we lost as far as the the educational opportunity over at Disney's Hollywood Studios. But I think, yeah, the, the Animation Academy portion of the attraction, when you can actually come out and have your own character that you were taught to draw by a real Disney artist and animator is a great free souvenir that you can take from the parks as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't uh, wait to see what character everyone thinks I'm going to be. <laughs> this is going to be great. Best show ever. Just because of the comments in the show notes. All right. I'm going to... Um, uh, I think that was great. I'm going to move over, though, to Disney's Animal Kingdom because I did want to try and touch on each of I the I was waiting parts. for you to get over there. You, well, and, and look, people say, Lou, I get it. You know, Tree of Life and the, the animals and the bugs and the safari. I get the educational opportunities, but I think there is so, so much more there. Um, and I could really easily rattle off the top 10 educational opportunities in Disney's Animal Kingdom. Uh, I think for... 
young kids. Um, I, I think there's a lot here. Uh, one of the things that my kids did, which they just had a blast, and we spent all day doing it with them, is the Kids Discovery Club. And this is free, and it's for about kids ages maybe four to eight, four to nine. You get this, and it's free, a souvenir sort of passport or a logbook. And there's all these activity stations throughout Disney's Animal Kingdom in different areas. Cast members are there. They supervise these different activities with the kids. They learn something. They take something away. They get a stamp in their logbook, so there's a reward at the end. And if you get all six stamps, there's a final sort of stamp you get in your passport. Very, very, it's educational with being fun first, and it's everything from bugs to how to, you know, start your own, uh, you know, little um, garden or whatever in your backyard. It runs the gamut, boys and girls. I have one of each. Uh, they both liked it. Again, it's it's very educational, very re- rewarding, and it gives you a chance to sort of explore and enjoy Disney's Animal Kingdom the way it should be. Certainly, as you wander the park, there's all the animal encounters, not just on Discovery Island, but you'll find cast members walking around with a little cage with a tarantula in it or a a parrot or whatever it might be. And you'll find them giving mini intimate presentations about those animals to adults and kids. Again, great opportunity to learn more, to interact with the cast members and, and understand more about the world around us. Certainly Rafiki's planet watch uh, for those of you that make the trek out there on the, on the train really gives you a chance to learn about the environment and conservation, how animals at the park are cared for. You can find veterinarians there uh, for those kids that really love animals and, and look every five and six year old says they want to be a vet. Well, if they're really serious as they get older, or even at that age, they can go and watch a vet performing his or her job and talk to them. Certainly, there's the animal petting area as well. The list for Animal Kingdom, Tim, literally goes on and on and on. Uh, I think it's one of the best places as far as multitude of educational opportunities. Yeah, it's funny because every five-year-old I know wants to be an artist. So that's what... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's 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 a throw it my way. So, hey, this is a this is this is perfect. You actually reminded me of one, and I'm 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 what's the right word? How about flabbergasted that I didn't think of this one before? And it might be on your list for all I know. And I should have mentioned it a few back, but I'm going to focus on Kidcot, even though we were in World Showcase right now, or, or we were a while back. But did you say um, flabbergasted? Yes, I did. Do you wear? Do you still wear dungarees too? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, move on. <laughs> I have shorts on. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't, <don't laughs> um, no, Kidcot throughout, well, throughout Epcot, actually, but starting with, of course, World Showcase. Um, I, I think as we talked about um, going through World Showcase and experiencing the different cultures and learning different things about different countries... Um, kind of overlook the fact that there is a perfect way for kids to do this um, without, hopefully without feeling like they're being dragged through World Showcase and this is boring, get me back to the rides and all the fun stuff. Um, Of course, everybody probably knows, but each country in World Showcase has a kid cot station where kids can get a, a mask and color it Although, Lou, tell me if I'm wrong. I thought um, they might be changing that up, the mask idea. It's, uh, I don't know if I heard that right, if they're changing to something else. Yeah, Duffy the Bear. Duffy the hey. Bear is, is, yeah. is uh, making his presence known in World Showcase. And actually, I remember when my daughter did her first uh, Kid Cod experience, you actually did, um, uh, you did an individual craft in each country. We, uh, we had, uh, she made little trolls out of uh, corks from bottle tops mm-hmm. and um, origami in different places, which was really neat but real t- really time-consuming, which is, I think is why they, they flipped over. But um, I, I'm just amazed. Everyone, every kid I know that goes and experiences Kid Cut it's, absolutely loves it. And um, not just because it's fun, and it is, but they will say to me that they, you know, it was fun talking to the different people from the different countries 
and uh, if nothing else, learning how to say hello and what my name is in a different language and having them write it for you. Um, and if you have kids and they're going through KidCot, encourage them to talk to the cast members and ask questions because that's what they're there for and they love to talk to you. But it, it's such a great way to learn about all the countries as you tour around. And I dare say if you're a parent walking around with your child and you don't take that opportunity to go off in the store and do some shopping, if you actually sit with your child and listen, you, you might learn something too. And it's... Um, it really makes for a fun outing for kids. I remember when my daughter took her first kid cot, and it was, of course, it's Florida. It's 110 degrees in the shade, and it was brutal, and we got about halfway around. And I asked her, what do you want to do? I was hoping for, I want to go back to the hotel and swim. But she wanted to continue to go around and hit all the countries. Um, not only was it fun, but, but having the passport, which you can also get, where you can get uh, uh, the cast members to put a stamp in your passport. But the sense of completion that kids have in going all the way around the world and filling everything out and getting it all done, um, it's pretty nice to see a kid actually enjoy what they're doing and, and you know what, you're learning a little something on the way. And it, with KidCot too, it's not only in World Showcase, having pavilions in some of the other, or having stations in some of the other pavilions, um, such as the land and the seas, which I hope they're both still open. I'm not sure. Lou, do you know if they're both still open or not? Or The Seas was actually closed when I was seas there last. But I, I but, thought the Seas was... Yeah, but I, I know that I think the land was still there, and hopefully the Seas is coming back. Yeah. That was one of my kids' but, favorite ones. Yeah, yeah if, they, if they pop open here and there, they're great, too. Cause they, they take on a little different flavor than the, than the ones in the countries. You actually do, like in the Seas, they had different projects and things to do that related to, guess what, the Seas. Um, but a lot of fun. It's a, it's a great way for kids to experience Epcot where they might ordinarily think it might be a boring thing they have to do because their parents are taking them there. But KidCot, it's a great way for kids to get involved and actually end up having just as much fun as the adults do. And they forget that they're not riding rides. Yeah. You know, my kids go to Epcot now, and that's the first thing that they ask for. It's not about getting on an attraction. They want to go and get their mask or whatever it's going to be now to start doing kid cot. Even they've, although they've done it already, they want to do it again. And it's not again about, you know, Oh, you know, dad, there's nothing to ride on Epcot. There's nothing to do. I wish they would bring back dream finder. We've had those conversations. Now they want to just do the kid cot. And, you know, for years to remember when Epcot first opened, there were no characters. There were no kid cot fun stops. And it was not as enjoyable for kids I think now this really gives, like you said, a great, great opportunity uh, for kids. And I, th and I think you're right. I think the parents as well, too, to stay engaged with the cast members and have an opportunity to learn as well. And I think just to show you how much I just remembered this, how much kids like this. Well, you just you just said how your kids, that's the first thing they want to do. Um, I remember that day I was talking about where I was taking my daughter around. That was her day. We always, and I recommend parents do this if your kid is old enough. Like, you let your kid have a day. They're the boss. If they want to go to the Magic Kingdom all day, that's fine. You want to stay in the room and watch TV all day? That's fine, too. This is your day. Her day, her decision was, I want to go to Epcot and I want to do KitKat. I want to go around and see all the countries. Right. It makes them or, curious. I mean, it makes the kids curious and want to learn more. Now, the, the thing I, I like to add, and this drives my daughter crazy, this was the year of the millennium when the Millennium Village was up, and the uh, passport for World Showcase was extended into all the countries that were in the Millennium Village. That was a little too much for her. I had the mission of, Dad, will you go in and get all the rest of the autographs for me? So there I was with my little passport asking for autographs and stamps from, the, from Sweden and Scotland and Israel. And all these there is nothing other. wrong with that. And adults can go and buy... The World Showcase Passport, I think it's maybe $7, $8, and go get them stamped from all the countries as well. You can do a similar kind of thing where you actually have to go and engage a cast member and get your stamp. So uh, adults that maybe would feel awkward doing a kid cot fun stop and coloring in a shark can, can actually get a passport and accomplish the same thing as well. I mean, I'm not uncomfortable with that, but if you know others are, that's <laughs> Some of the parents might give you the googly eyes if you're sitting at the table coloring with, with the kids, so... Oh, that's what that was. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Um, I'm also going to stay in Epcot. Um, is, you would, and I'm actually going to stay in Future World. So you're saying, okay, the next logical place is probably something like the land. It's got a great educational uh, attraction. There's, you know, real working labs and there's tours and the greenhouse and the aqua cell. And yeah, and I think that that is one of them, but I'm actually going to go next door to a place we were just talking about. And it's the seas with Nemo and friends. And you say, okay, well, sure. There's the attraction. There's turtle talk with crush. While the attraction I think is fun. I think turtle talk with crush again, offers you an educational opportunity because not just because it's interactive, the kids get to ask the questions that they are curious about, however wild or they might be or how serious they might be, they will get an answer. Um, and it's a great way. And look, technology wise, again, as a geek, when we, when it first opened, we all were like amazed at how do they do this? What is the technology behind this? Cause we had never seen anything like that before, but the pavilion itself is an opportunity. Um, the aquarium tank was at one point the largest saltwater aquarium in the world. You, you can find out how they make that coral reef about all the different types of sea life that inhabit there. You can go to the stingray and the jellyfish habitats. You can see, learn about the, the life support systems. I, I mean, I liked it kind of better when it was sea base alpha and sort of had that undersea research facility, um, feel to it but there's also and one of the things i really like and i think a lot of people miss is the manatee exhibit you can see the manatees that have been rescued find out their stories see how they're being rehabilitated before they get back into the wild learn why it's important and about again there's that conservation message as well so the the overlay of the seas i'm sorry with of of nemo into the seas is a great way to maybe spark that initial interest in kids. But I find, Tim, that once they get in there, they really do want to learn more about... less. It's less about getting your picture in the mouth of Bruce the shark as it is <laughs> going to see the fish and going to look through all of the different exhibits. Yeah, actually, I had the C's on my list. That's good thinking on your part. Um, yeah, lots of things to see. There. I will say the manatees are a family favorite. Um, especially seeing the the cabbage floating all throughout the tank. (laughs) It's a wonderful thing. Um, For my last one, I'm actually, as much as we talked about getting out of Epcot, I'm actually still staying in Epcot for my next one, too. Um, And I think if I'm counting right, this is my number five. Although, like I said, these were in no particular order, so this is... This is not my number one, necessarily. This is just my fifth one, we'll say. Um... It's it's not really at the top of my list. I I just find it an interesting place to go, and I think it's another place that a lot of people overlook. And it's it's interventions, but not interventions proper where all the exhibits are. Um, now I'm talking about the interventions on the imagination seas living with the land side. Uh, two things there that that always struck me is. Uh, Quasi educational, but again, things that most people don't pay attention to. Um, in the back of the Interventions building is this beautiful, wide open space where there's nothing there. There's just a few benches and so forth. Um, at one point, uh, there was tucked away, and I think I, I looked in the door. It looks to still be there. Was the um, the exhibit for Epcot's 25th um, anniversary, where it, it walked you through. You know how Epcot came to be and and how it grew and so forth. Um, you can't see that nowadays, but there still is on the wall a timeline uh, of Epcot from when it opened to today. And again, for for the Disney geeks out there and someone who just really is fascinated by learning how Walt Disney World came to be, um, it's it's a really fascinating thing to look at to see which attractions opened first, which ones came later, what things looked like back when Epcot opened. Not too long ago, it feels like, but it's been 25 years and counting. Um, so if you find that, it, it's a great place to take a break and cool off anyway, but um, if you're into Disney history, take a look at the timeline. It's, it's pretty interesting. The other thing I feel that people overlook a lot is as you leave the pavilion from that side and you make your way over to the attractions, is a, a courtyard that's filled with uh, 
plaques in the ground that commemorate different discoveries and inventions throughout the years. And I'd say most people walk right over it, not paid any mind. Uh, but when you go by it, take a look. Uh, you'll see some interesting plaques on the ground. Some make sense, like the airplane, um, the electric light, and the, t the telegraph, and things like that. But you'll also find, uh, you know, the World Wide Web and um, the microprocessor and, and some other things. Uh, DNA. Not. Um, I don't know when DNA was invented, but it's there nonetheless. Is, uh, is Al Gore attributed to the World Wide Web? I'm just curious. No. no. <laughs> hey, you want to know? I'll tell you because it's. No, Al Gore did not invent the World <laughs> Wide Web. Um, it's curious though because I've been talking about this place with some people. I was on a on one of our kids tours of Epcot that we did. We were walking over this courtyard, and in the middle of the courtyard is is a giant round area that has uh, various quotes from uh, famous scientists and, and other notable people from the past. And one of the mothers remarked that, oh, you know about that, right? And I said, well, what is it? And they said, that's the actual center of Walt Disney World. And I said, wow, that's neat. So I put it in my memory bank and held on to it for a while. But as I learned later, that's actually not the case, so to speak. Um, some people even would tell me it was the center of Epcot, which any good map will tell you is probably smack in the middle of World Showcase Lagoon and not a place you could really go stand on. But um, for those who heard that story, it's, it's one of those ones that has been going around for a long, long time. But um, alas, it's not true. It does make an interesting anecdote, though, if you want to if you want to tell people about it, but don't steer them wrong. But if you do hear people tell you that's the center of Walt Disney World, you can tell them, no, it's not. That's out in a swamp somewhere next to the blah, blah, blah. You can kind of fill in the blank because the center, I think, kind of migrates depending on where the boundaries are. Yeah, and with all the, the acquisitions of a property and the selling right off of there. property, yeah, you don't really know where the, uh, so where the center it, is. So it's a, it's a place that most people overlook. It's got an interesting uh, urban legend story behind it. And even that aside, it's it's pretty interesting considering you know, you're in Future World and this is um, kind of what Epcot's all about, uh, seeing uh, you know the evolution of how man has – grown in terms of scientific discovery and knowledge and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's a neat place to examine if you have a few minutes. I think those are two great ones, and I think that there's many more like that. So even throughout Future World, you go over to Mission Space yeah. and the queue, there's all the quotes from the astronauts and things like that. So a lot of those you can find, Tim, just in, in general areas. You can find them in queues. You can find them at the exits of attractions. That's what we talk about. It, it's taking the time to look up, look around, and not run from attraction to attraction, but explore and try and find out the stories and the meaning behind all the stuff that you see. Uh, in the in the interest of really keeping this, maybe for the first time ever, a ten? top ten. Yes, I, I'm. All I'm right. gonna tell you, I only have one more, okay. and I was really tempted. To make my last one be about food, I was going to say lunch with a w lunch with an Imagineer is a great educational opportunity. It's that one on one contact with an Imagineer where you can just sort of go to town and ask all the questions you want to ask. But I wanted to make it. I mean, you like how I snuck that one in there? But I wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that you <laughs> so, got your extra one in you. there anyway. Um, so. Something on a more general term because. The quote from Walt Disney that he said before continues to sort of resonate in my mind as I was talking about the, this, about making it entertaining first and educational secondary. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for things you can do, specific experiences you can have that are entertaining first and are educational almost as a byproduct from it. Uh, I think about things like the lessons that you can take on property. And you might not realize that you can take horseback riding lessons. You could take archery lessons. You can learn how to ride a Segway. You can go fishing. Even if you've never fished before, you can learn about how to fish, the fish that are in there, the story about how the lake was stocked and, and learn from a pro how to fish. Even attractions, uh, 
you know, again, you're taking your kids out of school. You want to sort of make yourself feel better. There's things like Cyberspace Mountain and the Sum of All Thrills, which are really true interactive physics experiments. Your kid doesn't want to learn math. He thinks physics is stupid. He'll never use it. Here's a great practical real world application of the things that they are learning or may learn. And it's a great way for you to connect it for them. Say, hey, physics is important. Here's how it comes into play in the things that you enjoy about Walt Disney World. And oh, by the way, go ahead, go design your own. Figure out how it works. And they are having fun first, but they're learning along the way. One that came to mind the other day as I was walking down Main Street was actually over at Crystal Arts. And inside you've got, and there's a great story about the building and, and the, the shopkeeper and the store inside, but you've got the glass blowers and the glass artists. And certainly there, there's wonderful artistic value to what they do. Um, some of it's a little pricey, but it's also, they, they also give demonstrations. And I think it's useful for people who, Maybe are in, not that you're interested in becoming a glass blower, but again, for students, you learn about solids and liquids and gla- and gas and how glass is made, and you know about temperature and it's a, so. If you want to sort of bring that educational component from the classroom into Walt Disney World, you can do that as well. And and you, if you're bringing your kids in there, or you're bringing, if you're a teacher bringing students in there, you can teach them these principles almost without them realizing it. They almost, you know, subconsciously won't even realize that they're being taught because it's such a fun, practical application. And I think, Tim, that's what I was trying to get across from this is there are so many opportunities in so many different ways. And for the most part, all of us are learning about different things, whether we want to or not, without even knowing about it, without even searching them out. But if you do want to, add another level to your experience, or if you've been to Walt Disney World 500 times and you think that you've done it all, this is another way to approach the parks and to explore the parks. And you know what? It's not about riding rides and seeing shows and dare I say, even eating. Uh, There's ways that you can learn a lot. And look, the Imagineers have put a lot of time and a lot of effort into creating the stories and creating these environments and wanting you to to learn. And that's why I'm hoping that you for yourself or your children or for others will go out and start seeking some of these out. Because again, the list, Tim, could literally go on and on and on and on. But I'm glad you at least now know who invented the ABCs. (laughs) Al Gore. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So, and again, look, we can, we said at the outset, We could certainly expand this uh, to future segments, but I would also, Tim, like to hear from listeners about educational opportunities that they have either sought out or that they've accidentally found or that they've tried to create for themselves. I know a lot of people go to Walt Disney World that homeschool their kids. They use Walt Disney World as sort of a three-dimensional classroom to educate their kids. I'd love to hear from them about some of the things that they do or that they use in the parks or maybe what some of our listeners favorites might be or if they've ever gone to Walt Disney World and used the parks sort of in this way so and speaking Tim Foster about educational opportunities and Walt Disney World a great way to learn more about Walt Disney World is through Tim's Guide to the Magic series of books he has the Guide to the Magic books for kids the Lost Journals lots lots more of course we try and bring up some of these overlooked experiences and opportunities in Celebrations Magazine as well. For more information, you can visit Tim over at GuideToTheMagic.com and or CelebrationsPress.com. Tim Foster, uh, as always, top 10, top best of the best bananas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for not calling me Pickles. (laughs) Pickles. (laughs)
That's going to do it for this week's show. Hope you enjoyed our look at the educational opportunities in Walt Disney World. Hope you look at the parks in a different way next time you go. Thanks, as always, to Tim Foster from GuideToTheMagic.com. Go check out Tim's website and his books, including The Guide to the Magic for Kids. Of course, you know he's also my partner in Celebrations Magazine. You can go and visit us, find out how to subscribe and order back issues over at CelebrationsPress.com. I also want to invite you to come by the show notes for this week's show over at WDWRadio.com. There you can comment on this week's episode. Give us any ideas that you might have about other educational opportunities or some of your favorites as well. While you're there, also explore other parts of the site, including our blog posts, photo galleries. Join the community over our fun, free, and very welcoming discussion forums. You can visit the WDW Radio store where you can get signed copies of my Walt Disney World trivia books, the audio guide to Walt Disney World on CD, and lots, lots more. You can also download the free WDW Radio iPhone app. You can also find out all the different ways that you can interact and connect through Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, FriendFeed, and lots more. Also, while you're there, be sure and check out the video section of the site. I'll be posting new videos all the time. You can also come by and subscribe to the WDW Radio channel over on YouTube. That's the best way to get instantly notified of new videos. You can also come by and comment on the videos over at YouTube and send me a friend request over there as well. And don't forget, if you're a new listener, in addition to all the videos, all of the past episodes of WDW Radio are available on the website under the podcast tab or over in iTunes. Because I want you to be part of the show, I want you to interact as much as possible. If you have a question you want me to answer on the show, you can email me at lou at wdwradio.com. Or if you want to be heard on the air, you can call the toll-free voicemail line anytime at 888-703-2171. And if you want a chance to play Listener Fact or Fiction, where I may call you randomly, ask you 10 trivia questions about Walt Disney World, getting ready to do one soon, you can email me at factorfiction at wdwradio.com. Include your name and your phone number for a chance to play and win some prizes. Quick announcement about some upcoming meets of the month. I am trying to schedule November and December's. November's is probably going to be the weekend of November 12th or the 19th. Still working on details for that. Also trying to set up something a little special for December, so definitely stay tuned. As always, January's meet will likely be during the Walt Disney World Marathon weekend. And February's meet will be before or after the WDW Radio Cruise aboard the Disney Dream, which is February 27th. We still do have availability for that cruise. For more information, come by and visit www.radiocruise.com. Big thanks, as always, to my partners and sponsors, including MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, my official and recommended travel provider for all your vacation planning needs. And All Star Vacation Homes has more than 150 homes within just a few miles of Walt Disney World with private pools, spas, kitchen, lots more. You can find links to Mouse Fan Travel and All Star Vacation Homes right on the homepage of www.radio.com. Stay tuned for the next WDW Radio Live video broadcast and chat. We'll be trying to set one of those up pretty soon. I do sometimes do them spur of the moment, so the best way to find out about when those take place is to follow me over on Twitter. I'm twitter.com slash Lumangelo or on Facebook, facebook.com slash WDW Radio. Lots more that I'm working on here, not just for the show, but videos, other projects getting ready to announce pretty soon. Again, definitely stay tuned to the show for more information. As always, my friends, if you like the show, all I ask is that you please help spread the word. Let others know about it. So if you're on Twitter, tweet out that you're listening to the show and share the link on Twitter or over on Facebook. Come by, review the show and or the iPhone app over on iTunes. If you're on YouTube a lot, come by, subscribe to the channel, friend me up there or comment on any of the videos. And if you're a member of other communities and think that somebody there might enjoy the show, let them know as well. Most importantly, I want you guys to be inspired and take that first step towards pursuing your passion and following your dream because life is too short. And then once you get down that road, always, always keep moving forward and let nothing stand in your way. Thanks again for taking the time this and every week to tune in. I really do appreciate it. I know how valuable and short your time is. So the fact that you take the time out to listen to the show means a lot to me and helps me keep going each and every week. So until I get a chance to see you in the parks, I will see you online and I'll see you on next week's show. Thanks again, everybody. See ya. Hi, Lou. This is Matt from Naperville, Illinois. I was just calling because this, uh, 
It's our first time at the Epcot Food and Wine Festival. We're calling because we're having a great time. Just wanted to say thanks for everything that you do and uh, keep moving forward. And thanks for doing, like you say on every single show, thanks for doing what you love because we love listening. So thanks, and uh, maybe we'll run into you. All right, we'll see you later. Thanks, Lou. Hey, Lou, this is Corey, and I just came back from a great Walt Disney World trip um, September 19th to the 25th. My family stayed at one of the cabins at Fort Wilderness Campground, and I recommend this resort. It was so nice and quiet, and it was something different from the other resorts, and it felt like you weren't even in Disney World. Um, Also, I attended Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party, and this is a must-do. It was so much fun. Um, And one tip that actually worked for me was to ride the rides that you want to do before you start trick-or-treating. I was able to ride every ride in Fantasyland in less than an hour. So I just went on and off, on and off quickly from the rides because everybody else was busy trick-or-treating. And then once I started trick-or-treating, the lines were very short to get uh, candy. And one more thing, my family just joined the Disney Vacation Club, and we're very excited to go back in 2011. So hopefully I can meet you at one of the meet of the month next year. So see you. Bye. Hey, Lou. It's Tina from Ottawa calling. Um, I just listened to actually the two podcasts, one with Dave Smith and one with uh, uh, Jim Corcus and his uh, Vault with Walt. And I just want to say thanks, um, especially for the one with uh, interviewing Dave and his retirement. It just brought back so many memories um, of one of my dreams come true, seeing the studio, uh, being at the studios and getting a and being one of the fortunate ones to be able to go and tour the studios with the D23 tours. And, yes, yeah, seeing the bird, um, that was just amazing. And uh, I just was brought back to that moment and just was able to relive it all again. And then listening to Jim after, it's oh, my goodness, it's just awesome. When you two guys get together, I would just love to be a fly on the wall because you're just so entertaining and there's just so much information um, going back and forth. Sometimes I think that uh, I can understand why that you actually had to, um, uh, you have an extended version, which I, I laughed so hard when I heard that there was an extended version of the interview with Jim. It was, uh, I haven't listened to it yet, but I do look forward to uh, going into the, the notes and uh, um, the show notes and stuff and clicking on and getting that and listening to that. But thank you so much. Thank you, Jim, and and thank you, Lou, for, oh, just the entertainment aspect itself and just bringing back all the memories and uh, this nostalgia and it just getting, I'm getting so excited because um, just thinking of all this and then my husband and I and uh Another couple are traveling down to Disney World in October for the first time for the Food and Wine Festival on the 23rd of October. So that's so close right now. I'm just so excited and so ecstatic that it's just um, unbelievable. But anyways, um, I could go on and on and on very easily, but thank you again for all your podcasts and your videos and uh, Celebrations magazines and everything. It just keeps us in touch, and you are... in inspiration to me always and um i'm plugging away chasing my dreams and uh hopefully someday soon um you'll be hearing about that too so thanks again have a wonderful week and i hope uh you had a wonderful time in epcot which i'm sure you did and it was nice to hear the destination d2 that was enjoyable as well i could go on and on and on but just just a big general thanks and uh, we love you so much, Lou. Keep up the good work. See ya. Hi, Lou. This is the Paulson family from Colorado, and we're calling from the Riverdale Terrace eating breakfast at Disneyland. We are on our second day of our three-day trip to Disneyland, and everyone asks us, why do you keep going back to Disneyland? Well, we have our top three reasons why. Number three, Maynard at the Tiki Room. This was the best Tiki Room host we have ever heard or seen, and as quoted by Maynard, Bob Gurr has even said he is the best as well. Number two, we were here on 10-10-10, and we got to do a great pin adventure. We ran around the park, got some stamps, and earned a free pin. And our number one reason for coming back to Disneyland 
is the magical moments that cast members make for you. Last night before the park closed, we went on Splash Mountain, and we were able to ride it three times in a row without even getting off. That's why we love Disney, and we love your show. Have a great day. Hi, Lou. This is Dave Turner from Bear, Delaware. I was just listening to show 189, the roundtable discussion of Destination D, and one of your panel talked about the all the film they found in the archives of Disneyland being built, and I just wanted to pass along to all my fellow Disney geeks that uh, some of that footage is available on one of Walt Disney's treasure DVDs. It's on the from year eight. It's called Disneyland Secret Stories and Magic, one of the best of that Walt Disney treasures. Thank you so much for all you do, Lou. Have a great day. Bye. Hi, Lou and podcast listeners. This is Laura from San Diego, but tonight I am at Disneyland at Mickey's Halloween party, and holy smokes, is this awesome. Um, my candy bag is so heavy, I can barely carry it. And But even better than that, of course, the mansion is all jacked up again, and I love it. But also, Space Mountain is now Ghost Galaxy, and the soundtrack is different, and it's like there are fiery ghosts chasing us through space the whole time. It is so awesome. So if you're in Southern California, go ride Ghost Galaxy. It's so awesome. Uh, See ya.